Okay, so we've been looking at um, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, and um, in the New Testament and just before the birth of the Lord. So we see the Holy Spirit is bringing that information to Mary, to Joseph, um, to Elizabeth, right? Elizabeth prophesied about the coming of the Lord. Okay, so let's look at um, uh, Luke chapter 1 and verse 67, okay, where um, the Holy Spirit actually comes upon or fills the father of John the Baptist. Okay, Holy Spirit fills the father of John the Baptist, whose name is Zacharias. We see this in verse 67. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, and the rest of the verses, till verse uh, 79, uh, talks about the prophecy. Okay, So Zach here was Zacharias. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesies. Okay, so we see that as a you know, very frequent recurrence that the Holy Spirit came upon people and they spoke forth as inspired by God. They gave a message right? as the, as the Holy Spirit uh, put their message in their heart. They spoke out. Okay? So we again see uh, what they what he prophesied okay let's let's just quickly read through what he prophesies uh, and who he is prophesying about okay he says blessed is the lord god of israel for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of a servant david he's talking about the messiah coming messiah as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets who have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy form a promise to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. So this is about the Messiah. Okay, He's referring to what the previous prophecies were and he's saying that this is this is what it is. The Lord is saving his people. He has visited, he has redeemed his people. Then from verse 76, he's prophesying to his own child, his son, John, saying, and you child will be called the prophet of the highest, for you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God with which the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to those who sit in darkness and the, sh and the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So he's talking about John, what John will do about the ministry of John the Baptist, right? So twofold, one is about the Messiah, one is about John and he is prophesying and right? he prophesies um, this Okay. So that is again a work of the Holy Spirit before the Lord was uh, born. Okay, then we read about uh, what the Lord does through Simeon. Okay, we read about Simeon, Luke chapter 2, 25. Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. Now, Simeon is, uh, we read about Simeon. It says that he was a man in Jerusalem and he was uh, just, devout, waiting for the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Okay. So this is Simeon, verse 26, Luke chapter 2, verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So what did the Holy Spirit tell him? You know, you will not die before you see the Messiah. Right? You will see the Messiah and only after that you would pass away. Now he was uh, an old man, right? So we see here. Verse 27, so he came by the Spirit into the temple, okay, led by the Holy Spirit into the temple. He came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law. Okay? So he comes in at that exact moment. Now, I'm sure, you know, during those times, there were many parents bringing many of their children for the customary or ritualistic circumcision in the temple. So they, so he comes in exact, led by the Spirit 
at that exact time. So he's led by the Spirit. He comes in by the Spirit and he sees um, this and he says, you know, verse 28, and he took him up in his arms and blessed God. And this is what he said. Okay? He took the baby Jesus in his arms and this is what he said. Lord, you are now letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Okay, Wonderful, right? He's talking about Jesus. And he's saying, you know, he is the light to bring revelation to the Gentiles, which means the non-Jewish people as well, right? And uh, he's going to bring that. I have seen your salvation. This is your plan for salvation. Um, okay. Uh, I just saw, heard something. Just one second, please. Okay. Right. Okay. So, uh, so we see this something wonderful, and as we read those words, we see the, the amazing, you know, the wisdom of God, the plan of God, and the timing of God. Right. Uh, we all that we see in these verses, and how the Holy Spirit leads Simeon. Okay. Now, the fact is that he was acquainted with God. He was acquainted the ways with the ways of God. Uh, the Bible declares him to be a person who was just and devout. Okay, He's just and he's devout, uh, probably a man of devotion, a man who was sincere. Um, Can't hear you. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, Can't hear what you're uh, saying. Yeah. Sorry about that. So it says here that uh, he was a devout man, which means uh, he was a man who was, uh, you know, he was given to, he was devoted to the ways of the Lord. And he seems to know information about the Messiah, so which means he has read through the law, read through the scriptures, and, and so on, right? So he was a man acquainted with the ways of God, acquainted with the word of God or the scriptures. And um, here we see the Spirit of the Lord leading him and showing him. Now, well, we don't know why, why specifically for Simeon, but God had told him. You know, we see that he was a man who was pretty intimate. He had an intimate walk with God. And God had told him, you know, you will not die before you see the Messiah. And so happened that he physically, you know, he saw the Messiah, he held him in his hand, and he also, uh, you know, confirms it, you know, here is the light to bring Gentiles, a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Okay. Then he says something to Mary, okay, uh, which is again interesting. Then Simeon, verse 34, verse 33, Joseph and Mary are very, very surprised. Wow, here is this man who's just coming out of nowhere and he's saying this is, you know, this is who he, God, this is who Jesus is, this is the salvation. So they are, they are marveling, it says. They marveled at uh, the things that were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Okay, so it's a very sobering uh, message to Mary, you know, uh, about the kind of uh, sadness or the intense sorrow that she will experience, right? Um, and this is, she says, a soul will pierce through your own soul also, and the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Okay, the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And, and, um, and the Lord Jesus did that, you know, in his earthly ministry, we see that uh, repeatedly it says, and Jesus knew their thoughts. Jesus knew their thoughts. Right? He knew what was in their hearts, what their true intentions were, and he and he actually questions them and he asks them. Right? So Simeon reveals that. And why? And how? It was by the Spirit of the Lord. Right? So we see the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Simeon. Okay. Then, um, then we see that uh, uh, the Lord Jesus is born 
And after that, we see, um, I'm just going to Luke chapter 3, verse 16. Okay. Um, verse 16 and 17. So this is John the Baptist introducing the Lord Jesus. And he says, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So he's prophesying about something that the Lord Jesus would do. How he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, that would come after the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus. Um, you know, uh, after those three, three and a half years. And after he is crucified after he's resurrected, after he ascends, and then this would happen. Right? The people would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. So with John here, uh, uh, he's, he's actually prophesying as he introduces Jesus. He's saying Jesus will baptize with Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, uh, We see the same thing in Matthew chapter 3 as well. So, so these are some things that we see about the Holy Spirit in the New Testament just before the Lord Jesus was born, and the last reference was, of, you know, uh, in uh, just before he was baptized. Okay, yeah, Shani. Yeah, I just have a question. I know you said that this baptism is, you know, after Jesus was crucified and everything. So is this kind of like baptized with the evidence of speaking in tongues? Is this what this means? I was a little bit confused about that. I'm sorry, uh, the last part? So I was a little bit confused. I didn't know if this is, you said this is after Jesus is um, crucified, resurrected. So is this like, when he baptized you with Holy Spirit and fire, is this like what the baptism with the Holy Spirit evidence is speaking in tongues? Is this what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, for every believer that they will have that experience, uh, which the Lord Jesus referred to as the promise of the Father. And he waited, we are, and he told the disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father. Yeah, so it's referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which Jesus promised as well. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So here's something, um, uh, you know, any, any other questions so far? What is the meaning of baptism in fire? Okay, so we see, uh, you know, when we look at um, uh, verse 17, you know, it says, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. And he says uh, about a refining work, right? Refining work of the same Holy Spirit. Okay. Verse 17 talks about how he will thoroughly clean, clean out the threshing floor, gather the wheat into his barn, the chaff he will burn with unquenchable, unquenchable fire. Okay. Same thing we see in Matthew chapter 3 also. So he's talking about the refining work of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the Holy Spirit, well, we, we, we look at the empowering work of the Holy Spirit, which accompanies the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because um, the Lord Jesus very specifically says, you will be clothed or endued with power from on high. So wait, wait for the promise of the Father, referring to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But also, we know in a believer's life, and uh, uh, we see that the work of the Holy Spirit is a, refining work, right? Much like how the fire burns and refines, um, how the fire purifies. It is also a refining work of the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, so baptism uh, in fire would be the refining work of the Holy Spirit, which um, uh, John himself explains. He's winnowing fan his hand, uh, and he will thoroughly clean out the threshing floor, etc. Hope that helps, right, Shekhar? <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's let's look at the next uh, the next topic, which is yeah yeah. Uh, so, sorry, I didn't understand. What is that? Um, why did?
Um, yeah, okay, I can hear you. Yeah. Why was Jesus baptized? Why was Jesus baptized? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So why did Jesus himself take? Why? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so the thing is, uh, I think Jesus explains it. Um, you know, when um, when everybody was baptized, Jesus comes and to be baptized by John, and uh, he, he explains it in this way. You know, Matthew chapter 3, um, verse 11 onwards, I think. Okay, so, yeah, uh, I think it's verse 13. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Um, and John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now for thus it is fitting to fulfill fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness and then he allowed him okay so so what is what is the lord saying here the lord saying okay this is first of all he's saying okay you permit me to do that permit me to uh, uh, you know go through this but this is what the righteous requirement is okay, it is to fulfill the righteous requirement and that's how he puts it Okay. This is the righteous requirement to be baptized, and so just permit it to be so. Did Jesus himself have a need to be baptized? Because why? People are being baptized for their sins, right? As a sign of repentance. Does Jesus have any sins to be repent of? No, we know that. But he says, you know, this is a righteous requirement, so permit it to be so. So that's the only explanation that we have right there. And he explains it saying, this is, you know, uh, so we know that he didn't need to repent. It's not symbolic of any repentance that he had to, uh, you know, any sins that he had to let go of. We know that. But, you know, and there's one, one more thing that we can consider is that it was as a role model and as an example for us to follow, for us as New Testament believers. Because in the Great Commission, he commanded the disciples, said, go, preach the gospel right, to every creature. Go to the nations, preach the gospel, teaching them all the things that I have observed you, uh, that I have taught you, teaching them to observe all the things that I have taught, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it's part of the Great Commission, and he is the example. He did it, and he taught the disciples to go and do that as well in the Great Commission also. So, so that's another thing to consider, that he was our example in by undergoing uh, uh, or by taking part in water baptism. One is righteous requirement. Second one is uh, being an example, being an example for us to follow. Right? Okay, it uh, shows humility and obedience to the Father. Okay. Thank you, Sanjay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, any other questions, please, before we go? Oh. Okay. Right. So then we, when we look at the next topic, you know, how Jesus ministered, we are, we're saying that Jesus ministered, it's very important to consider this, he ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, he ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So was Jesus the Son of God? Was Jesus God? Absolutely. Okay, Because how do we know that? Somebody asks, you know, is Jesus God? What would you say? How do we tell them? He was a man. He was born. Is Jesus God? What would you tell? Like Vishnu, suppose I come and tell you, you know, ask you, you know, how can you tell me Jesus is God? Show me from the Bible. 
where does it say Jesus is God? Yeah, but where does it say that he is God? Right? Um, online students, yeah. John chapter 1. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Did not comprehend it. Okay, very good. So it, it talks about the pre-existence, uh, you know, or the uh, pre-existence of the Lord. Okay, not just the earthly existence, but the eternal pre-existence of the Lord Jesus. We see the same thing in Hebrews also, right? And uh, Colossians chapter one. All these uh, scriptures testify to the fact that, you know, Jesus beginning, you know, like. His earthly life, yes, he had a beginning when he was conceived in the Holy, by the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and we know that. But he was from the eternal past. In the beginning, it says, what does it mean, in the beginning? It means, you know, in the eternal past, right? In the beginning was the Word, and we know that the Word is the eternal Word of God. Right. So we see that, yeah, um, Mark chapter 2, only God can forgive the sins, yeah, uh, yeah, all that is, um, yeah, that's that's also right, Shekhar. Uh, but, you know, when, when we ask for a direct reference, you know, we, we look into the word and we see that there are several uh, references pointing to Jesus as the eternal one, right, as, uh, as God, okay. Um, so, now... When Jesus came on the earth, to the earth, was he God or not? It's not a trick question, okay. <laughs> yes, okay, Aman is saying, um, okay, okay, you're Aman, right? And you are uh, Abhishek, okay, yes. Ashani? Uh, you said, was he God when he came on earth? Is that what you said? Yeah. So when he walked on the earth, was he, he God was... or not? No. I don't think so. Damn. Well. I was going to say yes, but then I thought about it. I'm not sure. So now. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the thing is, you know, not for a moment did he stop being God. We, know, we need to understand that, right? He is God. He always will be. But when he ministered, when he walked on the earth, we see something that he did, right? He laid aside his glory intentionally, and he walked as man. Okay, that's something that we're going to look at. Because all the things that he did, all the ways in which he ministered, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, He ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is something which is important for us to grasp, not just to study about the work of the Holy Spirit, but later what the Lord would teach us or tell us to do, because that also requires the work of the Holy Spirit in the same way Jesus worked. Okay, So we understand he's the eternal son of God. He did not stop being God. But when he ministered on the earth, he did whatever he did, the supernatural, the miraculous, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like, for example, when he walked on the earth, was he omnipotent? No. He was tired. He was hungry. 
right? So, was he omniscient? Was he in all places? No. Right? Or, or, or sorry, uh, omnipresent. Was he in all places? No. So, it, Scripture also talks about he grew in wisdom and stature, he grew in favor, right? So when he walked on the earth, there's something that we need to understand that he actually, it is like taking off the glory that he had as the son of God, as God. He, or the, what is the glory? The, the things that he did as God. Right? The, when we say a glory, uh, we can we uh, we can refer to um, the power, the presence of God, the glory of God. Okay, the things that he did, the things that he did as God, talk about as the we refer to as the glory of God. Okay, so uh, we are going to Philippians chapter two. Okay, Philippians chapter two and verse five to eleven. Okay, Philippians chapter two, verse five. Okay, um, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it to be equal with God, but considered robbery to be equal with God, sorry, but made himself of no reputation, having, so taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay. So we read in verse, um, verse uh, in these verses, we see that, yes, he, uh, he is God, he was God, but when he came, he, he made himself of no reputation. Made himself of no reputation. And that word, Greek word in kenosis, which means to empty oneself, kinuo. Okay, which means to empty oneself. So he was he was always God in origin and identity and all that, his deity, but he laid aside. Okay, he kept it aside. He emptied himself because he confined himself to a physical body. Yes or no? He confined himself to a natural, earthly body, right? This eternal God. He confined himself. So which means that he confined himself to being in one place at one time. That is what our physical body is capable of. He confined himself to a body getting tired, a body being hungry. He confined himself to it. Right? So which means that he laid aside that glory. He emptied himself. Uh, you know, that's which is what um, verse 7 talks about, Philippians 2. He made himself of no reputation, emptied himself, and he confined himself to this natural, earthly, human body. And he ministered when he walked. He ministered in what we can call, you know, this is now to the Bible, what we can call as sonship glory. Okay? Glorious, when, again, what does glory mean? Who God is and what He does. Okay, the glory of God. We say, you know, I saw the glory of God. Who God is and what He does. Right? So He He walked in what we can call as sonship glory. Okay, he walked as the Son of God, and He walked in sonship glory. You know, let's look at um, John chapter one. You know that reference that we just read, that Aman just read for us. John chapter one verse fourteen. Okay. Um, Okay, what does it say? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, he's talking about the eternal word, which is the Son of God, Jesus. The word became flesh, now is becoming confining to an earthly physical body, and dwelt among us, lived among us, and we beheld his 
glory, who he was, what he did. Okay, and the word used there is doxa in the Greek. Okay, glory, who God is, who he, who he was, and what he did. So we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, we saw his glory, we saw what he did, we saw who he was. Okay, he did many things, and we saw this doxa, this glory, this glory as of the Son and not of the not of the Father. We glory as of the Son, as of the only begotten of the Father. Okay, so he walked on the earth, he did things, he taught, he ministered, and he did it in the sonship glory as the eternal God confined to the natural laws confined to the natural physical body which was tiring which was you know hungry and so on uh, and he did that and whatever he did we're going to see now he did by the power anointing of the holy spirit okay. so that is something for us to again you know, consider and un understand because we are coming to a place where the Lord turns around and says, in John chapter 14, you know, he who believes in me, the things that I do, he will do also. So many times as believers, we look at the wonderful things that he did, and we say, Jesus, you were God. You, when you walked on the earth, you, you did it as God. So how can you expect us? We are only human beings. How can you expect us to do it? The Lord is saying, whatever he did, Scripture points to the fact, the Lord himself says, that he was anointed by the Holy Spirit in order to do the supernatural acts. Which is why he can say, he who believes in me, the things that I do, he will do also. Why? The others who believe in him will also be anointed by the Holy Spirit. And because of that, they can minister the way Jesus did. Because of that, we can minister the way Jesus did. Okay? Now that's wonderful, right? It's wonderful hope. There's wonderful, great news for ministry, right? Because Jesus is saying that even as he was filled by the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit, in the same way we also can be, will be, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, to do the things, same things. Okay, Let's look at John chapter 17. Okay, I'm sure uh, there could be questions here, but we just look at John chapter 17 and verse 5. Okay, John chapter 17 and verse 5, the Lord, you know, John chapter 17, the whole of uh, John chapter 17 is uh, the whole, uh, the prayer of the Lord Jesus. Right? He's praying to the Father, he's praying for the disciples, uh, whom he's going to leave behind, and so on, right? So in seven, uh, he's talking about the, uh, he's talking to the Father, he's praying, and he's saying, I've glorified you on earth, that's verse 4, I've finished the work for which you have given me to do, etc. And verse 5 he says, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay, there's another verse here, which talks about Jesus himself saying, I was there, before the world was, right? Okay, that's one thing. But, but here he's saying, he's saying, the glory which I had with you before the world was. Okay, so John chapter 1 talks about, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Son. Again, going back to the word glory, it means who God is and what he is. You know, in a very simple way, that's what glory is, right? Um, when we say glory, beheld the glory, who God is and what he did or what he does, right? So here he's saying, glorify me with the same glory which I had with you before the world was. So he's saying, God, I'm walking in sonship, glory. Now I've finished, I'm coming back. Let me have the same glory that I had with you. So we understand, yes, he is divine. But when he walked on the earth, he walked in what we can call as sonship, glory. He confined himself to the natural physical uh, body and the laws and so on. 
and whatever he did we're coming to that whatever he did he did by the power of the holy spirit okay so the, now this is what the people had to say um you know luke chapter 4 verse 17 okay this is what the disciples had to say about um all the people had to say about what um uh you know uh, sorry um about what he did like luke chapter 4 verse 17 um and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the Lord Jesus testifying. Okay? Uh, he's reading from the scroll of Isaiah and verse 18. He's saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the Line, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now, this is, he's basically, what is he describing here? This is my ministry. He's saying this is the ministry, to preach the good news, to open, the, the to set at liberty those who are captives, those who are in prison, recovery of sight to the blind, right? to heal the brokenhearted, and uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So basically, basically, the Lord is saying, this is my ministry. And before everything starts, he's saying, the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me. Okay, so he's reading that prophetic scripture, which is actually about him. And then, verse 20, he closes the book, gives it back to the attendant. And verse 21, he says, Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Okay, so even before that, we see... The water baptism happening, Luke chapter 3, 16. We see the Holy Spirit descending upon him as of a dove. So here he's saying, I have been anointed to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those who are uh, oppressed, and to open the eyes of the blind, to ac proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So what is he saying? He's saying, I've been anointed by the Holy Spirit to do this. Okay, let's look at a few more scriptures. Okay, uh, let's look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And maybe you can turn to Acts chapter 10, um, verse 38 also. Okay, Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4 says, How shall we ex escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who, also, who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. God bearing signs or bearing witness with signs, wonders, various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Everything that the Lord Jesus did. So he's talking about the message of salvation. You know, how can we escape if we neglect this great salvation and uh, we need to hear it we need to give earnest need etc and he's saying god is bearing witness with signs wonders miracles, and gifts of the holy spirit okay um then acts chapter 10 verse 38 um okay let me just quickly turn there yeah um shani question yeah, I, I know you said the glory is who God is and what he does. Can you just explain the sonship again? What is? I said, I know you put, I know you told, I know you said that the glory is who God is and what he does, but can you explain yeah. about the sonship again, please? Um, I'm sorry. So glory is who God is and what he does. Yes, yeah. Can you explain yeah. about the sonship? Because about the sonship okay yeah, so sonship. Yeah. so sonship you know this is a term that um, you know we're just using it to explain what the glory that the son had son jesus had while he was on the earth so we're just saying that uh, you know that is what we can call as sonship glory or the glory of the son right so who the son was and what he did right because um, we saw, saw in john chapter 17 where verse 5 where the lord is saying you know now now, let me have that glory, which I had with you uh, before the world was. And uh, John chapter 1, the latter part of it, we saw that the uh, John's writing and saying that he became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Whose glory? The Son, the Word, who became flesh, Jesus. 
So we are referring to that as the sonship glory. So it's just a term that we're using to, you know, refer to who Jesus was and what he did. Uh, just to, you know, make that distinction that um, here he was walking as man uh, in the natural and the things that he did, he was doing by the power of the Holy Spirit, just for us to make that distinction. Okay, thank you. Right. Okay, so when we look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, it says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, right? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Okay, so very clearly it describes how and what Jesus did. Okay. What Jesus did was is very clearly mentioned here. What did he do? What did he do? According to this verse, what? No, no, no. What did Jesus do? Look, just look at that verse. What did Jesus do? Who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, right? So those two things just um, compresses the earthly ministry of the Lord. Okay. Doing good, healing all who were oppressed. So we know all the things that he did, the eyes that he opened, the lives that he brought back to life, the healing that happened, you know, the, the people. And, and we in the gospel, we see that many came and they were healed. Right? And people came bringing the main, the, you know, everything, you know, they were finding so much hope. They said, oh, you know, I've waited for such a long time. There was no hope. And now I'm bringing him to Jesus. And scripture attests to the fact that all who came to him were healed. Right? So this is what, when we say doing good and healing all who were oppressed, he did the good things. He's talking about the ministry. The, the part before that talks about how he did it. Okay, what he did is in the second half. How he did it is in the first half. It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Okay, so he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And because of that, he went about, that is how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed. Okay. So why are we studying this? Because we are learning that um, okay, uh, we're learning that Jesus did what he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay. In fact, he, when we look at Luke chapter 4, he read the prophetic, uh, I mean, prophetic scripture, which is directed at him in the book of Isaiah, and he said, today this is fulfilled. Because he was already filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, he's there, the power of God, and he's saying, today this is fulfilled in your midst. And the disciples, you know, uh, uh, we see Luke again testifying in Acts chapter 10, and he's saying that this is what it was. He ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, so we are, we are talking about how Jesus ministered. We are talking about how Jesus emptied himself. Philippians chapter 2. Okay, now what does that do to us? How does this apply to us? Yeah, we are going to study a little later when Jesus teaches, you know, uh, that's the next thing. When Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit. We're going to see, you know, how Jesus teaching is saying uh, what the Holy Spirit does is something that is applicable to you now. Okay? He wants to do something in you. He wants to do something through you the same way the same Holy Spirit did through the life of Jesus. So that gives us so much faith. That gives us so much hope, you know, and so excited. The same Holy Spirit. Is it a different Holy Spirit now? Same Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that we studied, you know, was at brooding over the waters. The same Holy Spirit who was there right through, you know, he came upon the prophets, the kings. The same Holy Spirit is among us today, is indwelling us today. Okay. And he wants to empower us 
And he has empowered us to minister the way Jesus wants to, wants us to minister. Right? Okay, so that is that exciting or what? Somewhat. <laughs> okay, that's very exciting. You know, that gives so much hope. You know, that ministry that you do, or ministry that we are trained for, or getting equipped for, need not be something that I do in the flesh and blood, you know, just my special ability or my learning or my capacity. It's not about that. God will use that also. God will definitely use that, right? Like how he did in the life of Paul, you know, all his understanding of scripture and everything was used by the Holy Spirit right, in order to write two thirds of the, you know, of the New Testament, right? So God will use that, all the abilities, the natural, you know, giftedness and everything that we have. But the Lord wants to do something special. You know, he wants to do, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he wants to, us to mirror the same kind of ministry that Jesus did. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah, Sam, uh, you have a question. Yeah, uh, after we spoke about Jesus having... Uh, sonship glory, right? Yeah. And that verse in John chapter 17, verse 5, he says, yeah. Now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before with you before the world began. Yeah. So he's is it is this like a prayer to the Father before he goes to the cross? Or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a prayer. The whole prayer. Uh, okay. whole, whole uh, chapter 17 from hmm. the beginning, you know, we see that uh, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said. You know, Correct. father. So it's actually, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. And uh, we see that, you know, after this, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to be arrested, he's going to be crucified, and all that is going to happen soon after this, right? So, yeah. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. N number of angels. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, uh, what, what's your name, brother? What's your name? Vicky, okay, so Vicky's question is, okay, see, God has, the Lord has angels at his beck and call, okay, multitude of angels. So why did the Lord choose the, or why should it be like this, where the Holy Spirit comes and helps him, Holy Spirit comes and helps him to do ministry the way he did? Why can't he just release the angels and get things done, right? Okay. Does anybody have an answer? <laughs> Um, what do you think, Ricky? No idea? Okay. The, the, the thing is this, you know, the Lord wants us as believers to do the same thing. Okay? So in his plan and purpose, God so planned things that he is making us his tabernacle, his dwelling place. Right? He's coming, he's going to indwell each and every believer. The one who believes is going to be sealed by the Holy Spirit and he's going to be, you know, he's going to be our guarantee until the full redemption. Colossians, so Ephesians 1 talks about that. So he's going to indwell us now and he is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God. And we have the privilege and God wants to have the privilege of releasing his power his power, releasing his ability through the gifts of the Holy Spirit, through earthen vessels like us, with all limitations, with all weaknesses, he wants to redeem the world through us. Right? And we are actually partnering with him in, the, in this world, in this redemptive, restorative work. He wants to redeem the world, and by him indwelling us and by him, us cooperating with him, the Lord wants to reach and redeem the world. Okay, so that's the grand plan, right? 
so so the lord is saying okay the same way the holy spirit came and you know baptized me and enabled me to do the things the same way he will do that also in you right so i would say that you know that's the big plan of god okay there's one more question here how do we obey the holy spirit when the holy spirit guides us how do we hold on to the speaking and also uh, when the holy spirit says do this and don't do that yeah so that's the um, how do we do that is when we yeah when we simply obey him um and when we uh, i think that's it you know when we just obey him lucy uh, how do we do that yes there are barriers okay we will we'll study that in a later class there are barriers our flesh uh, rebels our unrenewed mind rebels right uh, and that's why scripture says if you are led by the spirit of god you are the sons of god and if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body you will live okay and also if you if you if you live by the holy spirit you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh so all these things uh, go together um so our unrenewed mind and our fleshly app appetites are definitely uh, barriers so these need to be put to death right um, we will we'll address that in the coming classes as well okay excellent uh, we'll stop here and then we'll continue in our next class again okay, thank you so much for joining god bless bye bye thank you very much sir